I want to welcome you to our Learning from Experiences presentation. As most know, these showcase the work of our fourth year students in a vari wide variety of projects that extend their education beyond the classroom and into the world. Always, it seems, with amazing and transformative effects. So first of all, I thank the students for doing such important work that does make us so proud. I want to welcome everyone joining us as guests today. This is, in my recollection, the eighth time we've done this event. And your involvement as audience and witness to the value of what the students are doing is key to the success of the program, truly. I'm going to turn things over momentarily to Dean Milde, one of our best supporters, and then Barb Bruce, our EL coordinator, will take over. And at the end of the presentation, you'll hear from Arasuksi, our associate director. I thank all of them, as well as our program coordinator, Jen Tramble, for their care and commitment to making so much and all. So it's my honor to do the land acknowledgement, and then I will turn it over. Western University, as you know, is situated on the traditional lands of the Haudenosaunee, the Anishinaabe, the Lunapiwak, and the Attawandran peoples on lands connected with the London Township and Sombra Treaties of 1796 and the Dish with One Coom Spoon Covenant Wampum. These peoples have long-standing relationships to the land and region of southwestern Ontario and the City of London and the local First Nations communities of this area include the Chippewas of the Thames First Nation, uh, Oneida Nation of the Thames, and Muncie Delaware Nation. I take seriously the responsibility to work every day towards reconciliation with Indigenous peoples and with projects and attitudes that promote anti-racism and decolonization in our community and culture. So with that, it's my pleasure to turn it over to Dean. Patrick, and thank you for such a, a clear enunciation of our, our mission and our, our duties. Um, so I want to just say a couple of words. First, I want to uh, welcome all our attendees. Um, thank you, as Patrick says, you are witnesses and uh, hopefully you will go forward and talk about us in all sorts of interesting and good ways. And uh, I really also wanted to talk to the, the uh, student presenters um, and to let you know, this is really one of my favorite parts of my job period, okay? I, I, I love this part. You are all living uh, testimony to the proposition that is central to SASA and to my vision of the Faculty of Arts and Humanities, which is that we are not somehow apart from the community, but that we are really core and heart of the community. And we show that by our interactions in our internships uh, and in our engagement with the community in the ways that you've done. You, you know, there's a sense in which it is a huge learning experience for everyone in, in involved, right? And that is the best kind of learning experience that there possibly is. Uh, for you, I know there, there is, you know, creativity, resilience, those are the things that come out uh, in spades. And especially for you in, in this, particular environment in which we're living, uh, extra challenges, right? And uh, you've risen to that challenge and you've done a great job and you've done the, the kind of real work of arts humanities that we all really aspire to do and which we love to see you do. So, so thank you for that. I can't wait to uh, hear what you have to say. I have to apologize. I have to leave uh, at the hour. Uh, something else calls me away. I would way rather stay here for the whole time, I assure you. So thank you and congratulations on, on all your achievements. Well done. Over to you, Patrick. I, well, actually, I'll just take over <laughs> if that's okay. Um, so uh, I also want to just take a couple of minutes to say something, and then we'll uh, we'll get started. So I want to thank everyone uh, for coming, of course, uh, especially our guests to support our students and our experiential learning program. Uh, a special thank you to the students' employers and supervisors for giving the students the opportunity to gain experience and for mentoring them so well. And of course, the biggest thank you is to the students themselves. Uh, you've worked so hard and you've conducted yourself professionally while juggling very busy schedules. I don't know when you sleep. Uh, your supervisors have given you all glowing reports, which makes me incredibly proud. Um, I have 
the pleasure of reading your reflections and your reports. And while I know giving a presentation is stressful, especially this time of year, uh, I'm so glad we hold these events. Uh, so the others who are SASA and friends of SASA get a glimpse into the impressive and inspiring experiences you've had. Um, it's also so important to show people what students coming out of the arts and humanities can do, the skills you learn, what you're capable of. So I, I'm just so grateful uh, for this opportunity for uh, and for you. Um, I'll just remind everybody of the ground rules before we start. So each student has seven minutes to present. At the six minute mark, Jen will give a melodious warning. And then after each presentation, we'll take three minutes for questions. Uh, we'll take a short break after the first four presentations. Um, and with that, we'll get started. So I will introduce our first presenter. Uh, joining us from Greece, as I wish I were, uh, Rebecca Jackson will be talking about her internship with Western International and her community engaged learning project with Western's Center for Research on Health Equity and Social Inclusion. Rebecca. Hi, everyone. Um, I'll just share my screen. Uh, thank you all for those introductions. They were great. It's really awesome to see everyone here today. Um, what, give me one second. Alrighty. Can everyone see it? Perfect. Okay. So, um, hi again. Really great to see everyone today. Um, so I'm currently in my fourth year of SASA. Um, and today I'm going to talk a little bit about my experiential learning experiences. So the first one was with, uh, was with Western Heads East and Mikonu Yetu. And the second one was with Cressy, which was the Center for Research on Health Equity and Social Inclusion. So um, before I go into the internships, I'm just gonna tell a little bit about the organizations. So I completed my first internship with Western Heads East um, over the summer of 2020. Um, it was done remotely because of the pandemic and everything. Um, but for this internship, I developed a website um, along with Jade and Xiao Xiao for Mikonu Yetu. Um, and I'm just gonna tell you a little bit about Western Heads East. So Western Heads East is a, a collaboration between Western staff, students and faculty and African partners. And it's focused on contributing to health and sustainable development. So one of their partner groups, as I mentioned, was Mako is Makonu Yetu. And Makonu Yetu is an East African non-governmental organization that works to implement programs that support female empowerment and economic independence. So for Makonu Yetu and for my internship, as I mentioned, with Jade and Xiao Xiao, um, we worked to develop a website that would showcase the important work and programs that Mikono Yeshu was focused on, all of which was facilitated through Western Heads East. Um, so the overarching goal was to design an accessible website to raise awareness and address gender inequality. And then there was other goals that had to be met in order to do this, which was uh, learning about the organization and its goals, forming a collaborative, collaborative working relationship with the Mikono Yeshu and the Western Heads East team, as well as our community partners, um, and then my supervisors, Bob and Maria, and then also one other goal we had was to make recommendations for improvements that can be made to the WHE website in the future. So in terms of the process and the skills, um, we had to use and develop to fulfill our, um, a few, like we had to use a lot of different skills to fulfill the goals. Um, and there was a mix of hard and soft skills kind of used in this process. Um, so a lot of what had been developed um, in previous SASA courses. So the first one was like developing the site really required us to have technological knowledge and a basic understanding of WordPress and other design platforms. Um, but we definitely increased those as we were going through the process, working with new platforms um, like Adobe XD. I remember that threw us off for a bit, but we, we learned how to do that one too and powered through it. Um, and then that really like learning these different new skills definitely helped us making the site visually aesthetic and accessible. And the soft skills that were necessary were communication and adaptability. And communication was definitely interesting in a lot more ways than I had necessarily thought, as I'll talk about a bit later on in terms of intercultural communication. Um, but just all the moving parts themselves, having you know the community partners working in a group team, also working with our supervisors, it meant that communication was absolutely crucial just in terms of getting stuff across clearly and making sure that we had those communication tra channels set up from the start so that we could best kind of talk about what needed to be done and make those decisions. And then those new skills were intercultural relationships and also professional relationships, because it was one of the first opportunities I had to work in like a proper work setting while also having a lot of creative freedom and finding that balance between those two. 
was definitely something that we had to learn how to do. And I think uh, Bob and Maria definitely had to say thank you for helping us kind of really find that balance in a great way. Um, so just going on to those relationships a little bit more. Um, all of them were very valuable. Like they're definitely going to serve me well in the future. Um, the first, in terms of working in a group, it allowed me to gain experience uh, when it came to splitting up tasks. And also it gave me a chance to gain a lot of new perspectives that were different from my own. Um, and just to see how other people think and kind of taking that into account in how I work in the future. And then the WHE supervisors were really great to work with as well, just in terms of providing support, ideas, and also I think they really trusted us to kind of make our decisions and that trust gave us a lot of confidence in ourselves, at least gave me a lot of confidence in my decisions and that was really great just for the process in general. And then finally, and I think one of the ones that was really, really new and great was um, working with Paul and Maimuna, which was our community partners from Ikonu Yetu. Um, it was really important because I got to learn about intercultural communication, um, which I hadn't had like a chance to do before that much. And I mean, just understanding that sometimes you've got to go into more detail into explaining how you arrived at a certain point, because you can't always just assume that the person you're talking to is going to understand how you arrived to that point. And that was something I had never really considered, having mostly worked with people with similar backgrounds to me or similar ways of just understanding the world. And that was a really important thing to understand how that kind of comes into a work situation. And it was, it was really just something that helped me a lot and like will definitely be useful to me. Um, so then, other than what I kind of mentioned in terms of communication and working skills, the results of the project were the website, um, which can be found at this link. I'll pull it up at the end if we have time. And then also um, the document with the recommendations for the WHE website. And I think most importantly for me also, like just learning how many things can be done with an arts and humanities degree, like understanding that I'm not limited to, I don't know, being a teacher, which is great, but it's not necessarily what everyone wants to do. And it was just really great to see that, you know, I could go into doing website design or I could use my communication skills in other ways. And that was really exciting for me. Um, so then moving on to the second internship. For my second internship, I worked with CRESI, which is the Center for Research on Health Equity and Inclusion. And it's an interdisciplinary um, a collaborative initiative led by the Faculty of Health Sciences at Western. So they have various projects going on, but the one that I was focused on aims to raise awareness about how healthcare professionals can provide safer, more accessible, and improved healthcare to migrant agricultural workers, um, and um, which who are currently facing a lot of barriers. So the goals of the internship were to create dispersible infographic and to learn about the ba uh, barriers migrant agricultural workers were facing, and that was done through different like articles and resources. And basically, we just had to raise awareness by explaining these different issues that existed, which can be seen in the image right there. Um, so once again, there's a lot of different skills that were used. Um, research and critical analysis was crucial to understanding a sector that I hadn't really had that much experience with in the past, just in terms of being in health sciences. Um, being able to read large volumes of text and kind of see, finding out the important information when it wasn't something that I'd necessarily been trained in was a new skill, and not a new skill, but a new use of skills that I had already learned to use in FASA. And then verbal communication and oh, textual communication was absolutely important as well, just in terms of making sure the infographic was, I'm sorry, my dogs are barking, just in, ter just in terms of making sure the infographic was getting um, all of the information across. And then graphic design was a new skill that needed to be used as well. So this is the first draft. As you can see, it was very minimalistic. And then we came to the final draft, which is a lot more colors and definitely very different. Um, so once again, working relationships were really important just in terms of learning about the intersections between various fields and learning about working in professional settings again, um, because working with uh, James Shelley, my supervisor was really great just because I don't necessarily know if I would have had a chance to work with him had I not done an internship that wasn't in the arts and humanities faculty. And then I'm hoping that indirectly connections could have been made with the migrant agricultural community in terms of improving healthcare conditions for them. Um, so the results of the project were the actual infographic, social media posts, which are these ones that you can see on the screen, communication skills, design skills, and professional interdisciplinary relationships. And once again, understanding that my arts degree doesn't have to be limited to a certain um, area of study, but can really find a way to help in all different kinds of areas. And it was really great for me to see how I could transfer that into health studies. Um, yeah, and these are the different resources from the things that I was talking about, but thank you all very much. Uh, yes. <laughs> thank you, Rebecca. That was great. Um, 
yeah, you had incredible experiences there. And uh, I love that you also, you know, recognize that you really have developed an incredible, uh, um, you know, set of skills that you can carry with you wherever you go. So, um, okay, our next presenter is Sophia Bellick, and she'll be telling us about her internships with Western Libraries and the Western Mustangs. Yes, um, let me just share my screen. Uh, is that is that good for people? Oh, it's loading. Is that good? Yes. Okay. Amazing. So hello. Um, as you can see, both my internship experiences stayed pretty close to home. So I'll just jump right into it. Um, so I actually worked with the Western Mustangs for three years. Um, and the way that the office worked was we had a direct supervisor who you can see in the back right of the picture, Ryan. Um, and then we had three teams. There was the graphics team, the writing team, and the photography team. And everybody would work kind of independently. And then everything would all come together at the top and mesh together and we'd put it on social media. So in my first year, I was just working with the graphics team, making weekly content for social media. In my second year, I took more of a leadership position in the graphics team. And then in my third year, I was managing the social media schedule which meant that I was at the top where all the meshing together happened and I needed to make sure that all three teams got things together on time and accurately. Um, and so you can see here, I put the job requirements on the left and what I put in bold correspond with some goals of things that I wanted to improve going into the position. Uh, and another goal that I really had for this position was just working in graphic design professionally. Because when I left high school, I was 100% convinced that I wanted to be a graphic designer. And that's changed a little bit, but this was really my foot in the door for working in design professionally, whereas I'd just been doing it for fun or for school before. And it's helped me get pretty much every other design and communications job that I've gotten since. Um, and on the right, you can see the programs that I had to use and the star rating was my comfort with the program going into the position. Um, this is a little bit of the work that I got to do. So these are some social media posts. Uh, I got to do a Christmas card for the Western Mustangs that was sent to alumni and donors. And then I got to do a purple shirt one year, which is given to the top team in an intramural sport. So it's kind of a big deal if you see someone wearing one of these. Uh, and so some of the challenges that I had in this position, first of all, I am not a sports person. I, I don't watch sports. I don't play a lot of sports. So it was difficult having to create content for material that I didn't really understand. Uh, and also my design style didn't really reflect the dynamic action packed look that you search for in sports advertising. So that took a little bit of getting used to for me. Um, additionally, I was very much a PC person and all of the computers in the office were Macs, which doesn't sound like a big difference, but I really struggled with that for the first month or so, as well as learning InDesign, which is notoriously difficult. It has a very steep learning curve. Um, but by the end of my third year, I was pretty much the resident InDesign expert. Um, and finally, leadership. Uh, when I first joined, the Mustangs, I was more of a follower in terms of design. I liked being told what to do, but um, my supervisor changed over in second year and I needed to take on more of a leadership position to ensure that the office continued to work the way that I knew it had to. Um, some of the outcomes, I got a lot better with layout design, which has helped me with my job at RBC and on student council. Organization, um, every file that I worked on, other people also needed to work on. So that helped me get a lot better at saving things in a very clear way. And also confidence in design. Um, by the time I was done, I didn't always have to ask, does this look good? Because I was confident that I knew that it looked good and we could move forward with it. My second internship was with Western Libraries. I worked in this teeny tiny little office in Weldon with two really wonderful women, uh, Julie and Rayanne. Julie was my supervisor and Rayanne was another designer. Um, and Julie was very clear that she was not a designer. So Rayanne and I got a lot of creative freedom, which I really enjoyed. Um, again, the job requirements on the left, uh, just to talk about social media management and SEO, which is search engine optimization for a second. Um, a couple weeks before I got this position, I'd actually had a different interview um, with Thomson Reuters, which I was turned down for. 
And in the interview, I was asked a question about social media management and I really messed it up. I did not anticipate that that was something that I would need to be familiar with going into these positions. So I was really excited that Western libraries um, would allow me to get this experience because I identified that it was a gap. Um, and again, lots of new programs that I had to learn, um, which was exciting. Here's some illustrations that I worked on, uh, some book face photography for the library, which was lots of fun. And then I actually got to make a tote bag for Western libraries, which they were selling at the front desk, which I might be biased, but it's pretty cool. Um, so challenges for this, again, I had to learn lots of different software. Um, but by this point, I was pretty confident with self-teaching. So things like After Effects, which was animation, and Lightroom, which was photo editing, I could pick up in about a day just by Googling a lot of things. Um, interpersonal relationships, I was used to design being a very solitary process um, where someone would ask me to make something and I would go into my little design cave and then I would come out with a product to show them. And because I had to do so much photography and videography, I couldn't just work solo. Um, I had to incorporate not only people who worked at the library, but also strangers for things like book face photography. And so it took me a little while to learn to get out of my shell to incorporate other people. But I think that's been very helpful. Um, and I got to work on my independence in a different way with long form projects such as the tote bag, um, like I said before, Julie was very clear, thank you, um, Julie was very clear that she was not a designer, that she didn't have a lot of feedback on things, so I got to guide the direction of that, which was both exciting and stressful. So what I got out of this, um, I did learn more about social media management. I got to use some really interesting programs, which I actually talked about in the job interview I had this morning. Um, I got a lot better at incorporating other people into the design process, and I'm a lot better at approaching strangers to ask them for things, both about design and just in general. And um, because I was one of two designers in this small office, I got a lot more experience carrying projects all the way through. Um, unlike with the Mustangs, where there were three separate teams working on things, I really had to do everything, which was very exciting and great for my work ethic. Um, so to conclude, both of them were wonderful experiences. I got to work on really great projects with really amazing people. And I'm very grateful that Sasa has given me this opportunity. So thank you here. Oh, it says part of this slide didn't load. Let's see what shows up. Here was some other stuff that I didn't get to showcase. Um, two of the images aren't appearing, but I just thought I'd stick it on the end even, you know, so it didn't, didn't become part of my time. <laughs> So thank you. That's great, Sophia. I'm glad you did. Stick it on the end. That's wonderful. Um, so uh, of course, I've already made a mistake. I forgot uh, to give Rebecca her three minutes <laughs> of question and answers. So uh, I think what we'll do then, if it's all right with everyone, is I'll open it up for Rebecca's three minute of question and answers, and then we'll do Sophia's. And so I get things back on track properly. Okay, does anyone have a question uh, for Rebecca? Patrick. Uh, so Rebecca, I really enjoyed your presentation and there's obviously a certain amount of similarity um, between the, the sort of ethos of some of the work you were doing. And at the same time, um, obviously the kind of people that you were connecting with were more sort of within the office um, as opposed to in the field, I guess, and that's partly the times we're in. But I wonder if you could, you're a real people person, so could you say something about, you know, whether it was sort of satisfying from a people standpoint and were there ways that you sort of found, found ways to kind of connect that might have surprised you? Yeah, um, absolutely. Um, so I remember in the beginning with the Western Heads East um, internship, I was I was really excited to do the project anyway, but I was looking forward to connecting with the community partners from Mikonu Yetu. And I was like, oh, that's going to be a bit more difficult seeing as we can't, you know, meet them live right now. And there's always going to be different issues in terms of, I don't know, connection issues or time differences and stuff like that. But I think we did a really good job um, of working around those and kind of getting to have those phone conversations when we could fit them in and also making sure that we had a text group that was always going on and we were always checking in and things like that. So while we definitely didn't, it was a bit harder to form those connections than it would have been if we'd got to do it in person. Um, 
we still kind of were set up for success in terms of being put in contact with all these different people and any gaps that we didn't get filled out from them directly. I mean, um, our supervisors at WHC were really great at kind of filling those in for us and making sure that we still knew a lot about the organization. And also um, Western Heads East internships is like a larger program where there's lots of internships doing different things. So there's other people in our group that we would meet with once a week, also doing things with Mikonu Yesu, but different things, whether they're working in more of the health sciences sector, things like that. So that way, kind of all the different gaps of what was going on in the organization got filled and we were still able to make those connections, even if it wasn't in the traditional sense. Great. Yes, it was breaking my heart thinking about you not being able to really connect. So that's good. Do we have any other questions for Rebecca? I would actually, I mean, you were telling us a bit about your, uh, you know, how your career is moving ahead before we got started, Rebecca. So I'm always interested to know how these experiences did impact on uh, a student's ideas about their career path. Um, so, I mean, being an international student, I was already, always like very interested in, I think, intercultural communication. But I think until I got a chance to do these internships, um, I didn't necessarily know that it was intercultural communication that I was interested in. I think it was more just like I liked connecting with people and I hadn't understood how that could be put into a workplace setting. So these two internships, one of them being the intercultural connections, the other one being connecting through uh, kind of design and also like words was a really great opportunity for me to see ways that I can take that passion I have to connect for connecting with people and communicating and taking that to a level that can be used in different kind of jobs because I always was like, how can I put, how can I put talking to people into a professional you know, situation like and make that what I really want to do and I think this was a really great experience to see that it's not only that I would have to go into I don't know journalism which is definitely one great option but there's so many other ways I can do that and still be fulfilled and get those connections so I think that was what was really great with both of these opportunities just showing me how you can put your passion into a lot of different projects right okay just one more minute for you for your questions but uh bob uh goff has a question for you uh being a student from the global north working with a partner in the global south can you give an example of a situation where you ran into critical and ethical global engagement and self-reflexive practice um thank absolutely you thank you um so i think that one of those um times was what i was kind of trying to go into um a little bit in my presentation it was when um, I kind of, we suggested something, I remember to my Muna, and we, we didn't explain how we got to that place. We didn't say, we think that we should do this on the website because this makes sense on the basis of it reaching a wider audience and kind of thinking it from, we had thought about it from, the, I remember the business perspective of if we do this, we can reach a wider audience in North America and we know how they will like react to this well. And um, it, was, it was about funding and donations. We said, we can add a link on the page that says fund here or like donate here. And when we suggested that to my moon and Paul, they were like, absolutely not. Like we, we don't, we'd rather have it written in a different way of, you know, how to help or how you can be involved. And that was something that we hadn't even considered that could be possibly, I don't know, a problem because that's what you see on North American sites, I think all the time and in Europe as well, a lot of the time. So it was just a moment at which we had to say, hmm, like that's just a cultural difference that we had never even considered. And we had to take a step back and kind of understand where they were coming from, where we were coming from and make sure that we were changing the way that we approach that in general. Thank you, Rebecca. That's great. Um, okay, for Sophia, we have a question uh, from an anonymous attendee, very mysterious. Uh, how did making this your SASA internship change your experiences with your experiential learning projects, particularly your time with the Mustangs, as I think you said you worked there previously? Yeah, um, so the thing that I really like about SASA and how I think that reflects and how I handle a lot of my work is that um, because SASA is interdisciplinary, it likes to throw you into a lot of potentially unexpected situations. I know the classes that you go into probably don't align exactly with your experience. Um, so in that way, I think that it made me view the Mustangs work differently. Um, Partly because, you know, I said that I, I struggled with working with sports because that was unfamiliar content. Uh, and that was before I'd really had a lot of SASA classes. But going into a SASA class about something that I completely don't understand and going into an internship about something I completely don't understand, I kind of handled them the same way. So I think that, that the SASA's ability um, to, to make me think quickly on my feet um, 
giving me projects that I maybe don't already have a solution to, um, I think was helpful. Uh, and I talked about that a lot in my reflections. Um, Cause I think it's just a good skill to have, to be confident that you can handle the unexpected. Yeah, great, great. Era, you have a question? I do. Sophie, I was so impressed when you mentioned that you got to the point with the Mustangs where you are managing three different teams. And I wanted to ask you um, about how you learned to manage. Like, did that mostly come from the experience with the Mustangs? Or would you say that there were some aspects of your courses and your programs in arts and humanities that contributed to that experience? Yeah, um, that's a good question. I, I do think that um, with the Mustangs, when I had to manage the social media schedule and make sure that everybody was getting things in on time, um, I think that was my first kind of leadership position. Um, and honestly, I think I slid into it pretty easily because I had already been working with the team for two years. Um, so I was pretty confident with how things had to work. And I you know, like I, I knew, I knew how people needed to operate. So I felt like, hey, I can just make sure that they're doing it the the way that they've been doing it for the past two years. Um, I actually feel like I've used that though. Um, I was vice president of communications of the Arts and Humanities Students Council this past year, and I think that the Mustangs helped me in that kind of leadership position um, because I had gotten pretty good at. Uh, keeping on top of other people's work, just the gentle little nudges and reminders here and there. Thank you. Any other questions for Sophia? I think there's one in the Q&A. Uh, well, I, yeah, I wasn't, oh yeah, there it is, okay. So this is from uh, Dennis Garnham. Excellent clarity in your presentation. Has your outlook or understanding of sports changed? What is one thing you learned about sports you didn't know before you began? Um, yeah, I would say that my outlook about um, sports has changed. Um, I love all of the Mustang sports now. I went to pretty much every in-person football game. Um, I'd say the thing that I, I guess I learned about sports teams, at least at Western, is the people on it are just so great and they're so thankful to the advertising and design team. Um, one of my favorite memories from working with the Mustangs was we put I think he was a linebacker on one of the billboards and I don't think he'd ever been on a billboard before. And he like hugged my supervisor on the field after he saw it because he was so excited because it's always the quarterback that ends up on the billboard. Um, so I guess in some ways it maybe like humanized college sports for me um, because I had to work so much with the athletes and the people. Uh, and it was, it was a lot of fun. I really enjoyed it. Great, thank you. Um, Bob Goff, uh, I don't know if your hand is up for Sophia or did you no, have a I question, No, I didn't. Bob? That was still up from the last question. Sorry about that. Okay, good. <laughs> I'm trying to watch about six things at once here. So, uh, there we go. Okay. Uh, Michael. Give me a question. Uh, Sophia, did I hear you say that you, uh, your view of design and uh, working in design changed through this experience? And um, how did it change and where is it going now? Um, that, that is a good question. Yeah, I feel like um, I became a lot more adaptable with my design. Um, like I said, I really, I think the toughest challenge was switching my design style from maybe a more softer look to the action-packed people running with footballs that I needed for the Mustangs. Um, I think part of what uh, changed about my outlook on design is I really like involving other people now um, because I think that getting other perspectives on design um, always makes it more interesting because I am definitely not the be-all end-all of what looks good. Um, and I think that the Mustangs and Western Libraries taught me that in different ways with incorporating staff and athletes athletes and strangers in the libraries, um, all sorts of things like that. OK, 
Okay, thank you. And thank you uh, to Rebecca too, to both of you for those uh, thoughtful responses. And uh, Rebecca, sorry again for missing you right after your presentation. I'll settle into this. Okay, uh, our next presenter then is Julia Campbell. Um, and she has taken on so many experiences in her time with Sasa and Ivy. Um, and I urge you to read her article on her volunteer work with Innovation Works, which is posted on the news page on SAS's website. Today, she'll be presenting on her internship with the Stratford Festival and her community engaged work with the Me to We program. All right, good afternoon, everyone. I'm just gonna get my screen shared here. Okay. All right, can everyone see this okay? I just realized my laptop is unplugged. So give me one sec, it's gonna die. Okay, sorry about that. Ready to go. Hi everyone, I could talk about this all day, but I only have seven minutes, so I'm just gonna get right into it. Um, we're gonna do a brief intro about me, then I'll talk about the Stratford Festival, I'll get into my Ecuador trip, I'll give you a little uh, intro to what I'm doing after graduation, and then the floor is yours for questions. So about me, if you haven't met me before, my name is Julia Campbell. I'm a fifth year dual degree with Ivy and English Lit, uh, and I'm from Stratford, which will be relevant later on. And here's a little bit about my interests. And I included this part, uh, not because I want to talk any more about me, but rather because it's fun when I reflect on these experiences now as a graduating student, how much I've grown along the way. Well, now I can give you this list of my interests and tell you how they connect to what I want to do in the future and how they connect to my experiences. Back in first year and specifically back when I was doing these experiences, I couldn't have done that. And I really attribute both of these experiences to helping me get to where I am today. So it's just a nice moment of personal growth. So I had two experiences. The first one was an internship, summer 2017, which was the year before a second year university uh, at the Stratford Festival Archives as an intern. And then I did a CEL the following summer uh, where I traveled to Ecuador for 16 days with Midui on a women's empowerment trip. So the Stratford Festival Archives. One thing you need to know about the archives is that they weren't created with a lot of intention. Rather, it was years and years of actors and creative designers and executives grabbing costume pieces and keeping them under their desk or in a cabinet. And eventually people said, hey, we really need to do something with these things. Nonetheless, it's the third largest costume archive in the world, despite the fact that the festival has only been around since 1953 and the two other largest ones have been around for hundreds of years. So it's very impressive. Uh, the work that Nat Scola and I, the other intern, did was a lot around taking all of these pieces and, and organizing them a little bit more, and most importantly, figuring out where they go and who they were by. There were a lot of pieces that, because they'd just been in people's offices, nobody actually knew what production they were from, so part of our job was making that a little more organized. So we would conduct research on costume pieces, that would mean looking through wig Bibles, set Bibles, design Bibles, production Bibles, which are basically just uh, like the journals of each person working on the project. Uh, we would also uh, create these descriptions for each piece as well as to take pictures of them with the goal of creating their first ever online catalog at the end. Um, and I'll tell you what those descriptions looked like in a minute, but by the end of the experience, we ended up doing over 300 descriptions for costume pieces, which are now used in their online catalog today. So just a little intro to what our descriptions would look like. Uh, we would give some info on the year, the production, the designer, and the cutter. Ask me about that later, but my passion project was making sure that the cutter was included as well as the designer, and I did a lot of interviews and research to make sure that could happen. We would give a description. This is a little longer than usual, but I just wanted to show you how detailed they were because prior to us starting, there would be about seven descriptions that would just say red robe, and for a theater that does a lot of Henry's and Richard's, you can imagine that that's confusing when you're trying to find a certain robe and there's seven different ones in all different locations. And then we would give some info on the condition, uh, the, the uh, time period of the production, et cetera. So I had a few goals and I had a few outcomes and I feel that all my goals were met. So the first one was I wanted to learn more about how business and the arts can intersect. I had this feeling that I was a true English major and that when I was gonna start Ivy, I would be selling myself out and that business and the arts are mutually exclusive. And I wanted to learn how those two things could come together. And so I could actually feel like a business student as well as an art student. I wanted to learn professionalization skills. I wanted to learn what kind of workplace culture suits me. And I wanted to learn more about the festival. I've been going to the festival since I was a little kid and I just wanted to learn more about what it's actually like behind the scenes. 
One of the most important outcomes of this experience was learning what a truly healthy workplace culture looks like. I had been lifeguarding for a long time, and while I really liked that job, it wasn't a very healthy workplace. So coming here and getting to work with Lisa Giffen, my amazing supervisor, as well as Nat Scola and my other coworkers, taught me about what a positive workplace actually looks like, whether it be Lisa making us take two tea breaks a day where she would ask us about our lives and we would get to know each other better, whether it would be her letting us run with our ideas, but letting us know that she's always available to answer questions. I really felt supported and I learned that a really positive workplace like that is possible to find and that it's something that I should seek out going forward. I gained a truly treasured friendship with Nat. Her and I are still very much in touch and in fact, we'll be at the same school next year, which is very exciting. Uh, I acquired the ability to guest production year in designer as a party trick. Ask me about that one. It's my networking specialty. Uh, it changed my perspective towards business school, where I now realize that business is just a support function for anything you want to do. A business education just helps you make sure any project, whether it's social impact, arts, etc., is sustainable. And lastly, I learned all the things that come with a big girl job, like how to wake up early and how to email my supervisor and all of those things. And here's some fun pictures that we can look at later if you want. My second trip, my Ecuador women's empowerment trip. I wanna tell you a bit about what I mean by a women's empowerment trip. So the goal of this trip was cultural exchange. I was terrified that this would be some kind of white savior trip. Um, and I really didn't want to go into these communities where we weren't wanted. Uh, but the goal of this trip for me was that you would be going to these communities and we would be learning a little bit about each other. And specifically with the women's empowerment, our goal was to meet with other women's groups there so they could tell us how they're empowering women in their areas we would tell them how we're empowering women at home. And because of that, we could share best practices and get better. The theme of this trip was empower women, empower women. And I really found that to be true throughout the trip. So first part of the trip was in Quito. This is the capital city. We were there for two days. It was mostly team building, but we also did a tour with Isabella. Happy to talk about this more, but it's not the most relevant part of the trip. Second part of the trip was a week in Chimborazo, which is up in the mountains. Uh, this was my favorite part of the trip, and we had four main activities. The first one was working on a school build site. Thank you. Was working on a school build site. We also did a lot of team building exercises every evening. We met with women's groups, like I said, to exchange stories, and we also did a day in the life. Happy to talk more about all of this. I just wanted to highlight at the build site and the other one we did later, it was always that the local production crew got a day off while we came in to support uh, the local leaders. So it wasn't us bringing in our own workforce or pretending to be construction workers. Lastly, I spent a week in the Amazon, uh, which is the Kanambu community specifically. We worked on a build site. We did environmental education with our jungle guide, Carlos. We did cultural education with our, uh, with a local member of the indigenous community, Sandra. Agricultural education with Mr. Vargas. We met with more women's groups and we did a lot more team building. Please ask me about this. Uh, and in terms of goals versus outcomes, I wanted to learn more about Ecuadorian culture. I wanted to learn more about global development, women's empowerment, uh, how to make my feminism intersectional. And I wanted to make some like-minded friends. And I feel like I achieved all of these. I learned, I had a true cultural exchange. I feel like I took a first step towards global citizenship and intersectionality. And I want to highlight first step here because I don't just become a global citizen because I did a trip like this one time, but rather it showed me a trajectory that I can continue to follow to improve myself. Uh, most importantly, I learned that global development should be local leader led, should always be requested by the local community, should support the local economy. So it should be a hand up, not a hand out mentality. Otherwise, you're just doing like a new fresh version of colonization. Uh, I made 14 new, oh, uh, I also learned that it should be grounded in mutual respect and that it should always be genuine. I made 14 new friends. We're still very close. I got a new sense of hope for the future. I had been feeling very jaded that one person can't change the world because of uh, the breadth of all of the social issues that I'd been seeing when I started university, but hanging out with these other girls made me realize the power that one person, uh, one person really can change the world, especially when one person is with a lot of other individuals that are passionate too. And lastly, I gained a career path. Uh, I'll talk about this if you want to know, but one of the development exercises we did actually made me realize how well my SAS education theory I learned can connect to real world issues and made me want to pursue law. Uh, and getting into that after graduation, so in September, I'll be starting law school at U of T. I'm interested in human rights, constitutional and international law. And I attribute this pathway directly to these two experiences, to Ecuador for helping me figure out that law was the way I wanted to go and my focus on intersectionality, but also for my Stratford internship for really helping me have something on my resume, learn how to network a lot better and figure out the kind of culture that I want in a workplace, which I'll carry on with me as long as I go. So that being said, uh, I'll leave it here and I'll open the floor to you for questions. 
We uh, really do present our students a challenge to try to talk about two experiences in seven minutes. And you, uh, you did a great job, Julia. Thank you. Uh, does anyone have, okay, Patrick? Yeah, I think maybe if you unshare your screen, Julia. Yeah. Sure. <laughs> I have there to see go. myself in order to think. Um, so that was fantastic. One of the things I know, you know, I've got the sense that you have become very self-aware. And I was thinking about the challenge of going into different institutional contexts um, in relation to your sense of where you fit in the maybe implied hierarchy or non-hierarchy or something like that. And it seems like that became sort of an important term in your experience. Do you want to say a little bit about that? I mean, when you went into Stratford, did you think you were going to be sort of an underling student? Um, when you went on this trip, did you think it was going to be a horizontal kind of grouping? How did that work? <laughs> yeah, so I'd worked, all of my work experience prior to starting at Stratford had been lifeguarding. I'd done it for years and years and years at the same pool, and I loved it very much, but it was definitely a structure where uh, who you are was taken very seriously. So when I was a lifeguard in training, I had to do everything that anyone told me. You know, they say jump, I say how high. Um, and that was all taken very seriously, partially because it was governed by students, so it maybe wasn't the best HR you've ever seen. Um, so I definitely went into experiences having that very internalized. So getting to start at a workplace where I was encouraged to ask questions, I was allowed to take ownership of my work, um, and that I was allowed to like chat with my boss as friends, even though that employer-employee relationship was still there. Uh, it made me realize that even though like, yes, um, like hierarchies are there for a reason and I'm in a role to learn from somebody that I don't have to be like constrained um, and that I can explore myself a lot more and take some risks, especially in a workplace where um, they're very open to like having you ask questions and try things first and then do it again later. Whereas in my previous workplace, you would have gotten trouble for doing anything out of line. So I don't know if that answers your question, but I really felt like I learned a lot about what a healthy workplace looks like. It does. And, and I think, you know, you display a great sense of, of uh, intellectual and other forms of mobility. And I think it goes, it comes from that. <clears throat> I'll also say, I think as women, we are taught maybe to be a little bit less, um, you know, when you talk about like star players in an organization, it's usually like the men who come in and are really confident and are like, I already know what I'm doing. Like, let me show you. And everyone says, wow. And I think women were taught not to do that. And I certainly see that in myself. So being at the festival in an all-female workplace with a really supportive staff, kind of helping Matt and I step up and take risks and say, hey, I really care about the cutters. Can we add this into the project? Or this is what we were thinking and have an actual dialogue really helped me on my journey to being a bit more confident in the workplace. Thank you. <laughs> Julia, that was great. Thank you so much. This is not one of the questions you invited us to ask you, but nevertheless, it's the one I want to know about, and that is about the cutters that you just mentioned now. Tell me what it was about that um, part of the archive that was particularly important to you and why. For sure. So part of the role, uh, like I said, when we were doing research, a lot of it was going through these uh, different set Bibles, production Bibles, etc., uh, but another part of it was interviewing different employees, whether it be in the warehouse or whether it be um, talking to the cutters. And in doing that, I guess you should know the way um, costume building works is you have a designer that will draw the sketch of what the costume should look like. I have a bunch of them on the wall behind me, actually. Um, and then you give them to the cutters who build the costume. So the head cutter will take this picture and just from a drawing will come up with like an actual pattern that can be used to make the costume. So it's a ton of work and they don't get any credit. So usually when you do these descriptions, it'll say the designer. So in the example I gave, it had the designer there, John Pnoyer, but it didn't have the cutter. And I thought that was a huge oversight. So when I met with the cutters, I tried to interview them and figure out who did what. So it's definitely an incomplete project. There's still a lot, especially the older pieces. I couldn't figure out who built it, but it was important to me to give credit where credit is due because that is so much work and such an interesting skill set to be able to take something so like, abstract and then figure out this is the actual fabric that needs to be used and this is how it can be cut. So that was my passion project and I hope that they've continued doing that. Thanks, that's great, thank you. Uh, one more question and then we'll move on uh, from Bob Goff. I may have missed this, but can you say more about what you learned about how business and arts can go together without you feeling like a sellout? Yes, for sure. So like I said, 
I used to have this feeling that I was this like quintessential English student. I could not imagine going to business school, especially when I started at the Stratford Festival because I hadn't even taken one business course, but I had AEO to IB, so I knew it was coming down the line. Um, and at the time when I thought about business, I would just think about like sitting in an office or like working on an investment bank. I didn't even know all, like the breadth of things that you can do with a business degree. So they really did feel mutually exclusive to me being an English major and being a, a business major. Uh, working at the Stratford Festival and specifically getting to see Anita Gaffney, who's somebody that has a business degree and an English degree, uh, seeing how this is still a really important artistic endeavor and something I believe in wholeheartedly, but then getting to see behind the scenes how these business skills actually make sure the festival can keep running, whether it be you know sustainable streams of finance or whether it be getting sponsorship or all of these things. It made me realize that a career in business is not me moving away from the arts, but is rather me gaining a skill set that can allow me to actually support really important endeavors, whether it be in the arts or social impact, et cetera. I now learned that uh, the skills that I'm gaining will just help me make sure any project I wanna do is sustainable and actionable, if that answers your question. I'm sure it does, yes, thank you. Thanks so much, Julia. Uh, we'll move on then. Um, the last presenter before we take a break is Xiao Xiao Kui. She'll be talking about her internship with Western International and her community engaged work with the nonprofit Single Women in Motherhood. Hey, hello, one second. Da, da, da. Okay, wrong slide, I'm sorry. <laughs> okay, everything, is that good? Okay, my notes and, okay. So hello, I did two internships again. One of them was with Western Heads East and Kunayatu, and the other one was with the Single Women Motherhood Training Program. I'll, I will be talking about Kunayatu first. Um, and I hope I don't repeat Rebecca too much here, uh, but Western Heads East is a collaboration between Western International and several African partner organizations, which includes Mikono Yetu, which is a women-led nonprofit organization in Tanzania. They have a number of positive programs that support girls and women in economic independence and development. Um, for example, their probiotic yogurt kitchens, training in entrepreneurship and financial literacy, resources for preventing violence against women and girls, and so on. And our goal was essentially to create a website for them to advertise and promote all of these programs that they have for a number of audiences, Western, um, African, wherever. Um, and again, as Rebecca said, we worked with, um, <clears throat> excuse me, I worked with Rebecca and Jade. We were a small team of SASA students with two contacts from Mikunoyetu to figure out what their goals were for this website, what they wanted out of it, um, how to promote their programs, how to get donations, everything like that. We also had to help revise the Western Heads East website in sort of a consultant role to revise the layout, the look, the content, things like that, but that was more of a secondary goal. So, um, Kona Yetu did originally have a website. Um, we were planning on revising that. That did not work out because of technical issues that were outside of our control, but we did ultimately contribute and create a website based off of what we had, the outline we had, um, created in collaboration with our contacts from the organization. This is what we made. Um, as you see, we have an overview of their programs, videos from their YouTube channel, resources, which I discussed earlier, how to contact them and get involved. Um, side note, I did check their website recently and it looks like they've already added some new things to it since we left, which is exciting for them. So you can find them here at mikunayetu.co.tz. Okay, and my second internship was with the Single Women in Motherhood Training Program, or just SWIM. They are another nonprofit 
in London who have a number of positive programs for single mothers, like life coaching, childcare scholarships for single women, for single mothers uh, in post-secondary education. And what I was working on um, with Alex, who will also be presenting today, was the 20 Stories of Hope project, which was essentially, um, we would ultimately be interviewing single mothers to get their stories of hardship and success and everything and ultimately create a book out of this, 20 chapters in total, 20 stories. Um, working with our supervisor, Anne Marie Ricketts, also the founder of SWIM. Unfortunately, um, one person had worked on this project before. We did lose some progress because of technical issues. We were able to recover an interview that she had already done and that will be, they will have that for future interns. <laughs> but uh, essentially we've started over. Um, Anne-Marie asked us to reach out to children of single mothers to sort of generate more interest in the London community to nominate their mothers to participate in the program. And to do that, we had to reach out to organizations and platforms in London to promote the program, the project. Um, so promotional work, advertising, it was not something I was used to. Uh, we did also create promotional materials and a means of collecting nominations. This is a Google form, there is more than this. This is just a snapshot of it. And a flyer to be used on social media. And we did eventually put these materials together along with the Emory and interview with Interrobang, which is a fan draw student newspaper and a few other organizations in London which wasn't without hitting a few dead ends first, um, finding some out of service phone numbers. <laughs> uh, but we did have these materials in the end, which will be used by volunteers in the future to continue this project. <sighs> okay, honestly, a huge challenge was just putting together visuals for this presentation because we <laughs> couldn't work on site. We couldn't take photos like the other Western Heads East interns. We just had to work on the website in our own homes and look at the blogs that previous interns had written where they got to actually see everything in person. Um, ultimately, our goal was to contribute to these organizations as well as we could in those circumstances we were in, not to be tourists and have fun, but yeah, this is my only real on-site photo that I had. But I do feel that I learned from all of these challenges as well. I feel that the remote nature of these internships really made us aware of the importance of consistently communicating with our partners to understand their goals and needs and how we could best support them. Um, oh, thank you. Um, and also another huge thing, I feel that neither of these were internships I would have actively sought out on my own. Um, I when I was looking for internships, I looked for editorial internships and things more on the creative side because that was what I was used to. Um, but I feel like being open to trying something completely different really helped me because I picked up some skills that I wouldn't have if I insisted on going that route. Um, I learned how to use WordPress, which is something I wouldn't have done on my own. Um, at one point I had to use Audacity to edit a sound file to make an interview anonymous for future interns. Uh, I had to make cold calls, which was terrifying, <laughs> but that, you know, in any position you have to know how to talk to people and how to communicate with people. And ultimately, I also had to remind myself to have some compassion for myself and for everyone because it's no one's fault that we're in the situation we're in. And I think I am grateful and proud nonetheless for everyone and for what we were able to accomplish. So yeah, thank you. Thank you, Shato. Yeah, I think, uh, you know, the uh, you're a great example of uh, sometimes when we set up these experiences and get going on them, they don't necessarily work out the way we planned. But uh, uh, you and Alex did a great job uh, of um, stepping up uh, with the SWIM uh, CEL and, and really uh, producing something that then the people who come after you can work with. So 
congratulations on that. Um, so, Patrick. Yes, um, Xiao Xiao. Um, these, uh, these internships seem somewhat complementary, but, but also in many ways quite different. So I'm wondering um, what sorts of, of strengths that you might have discovered in yourself um, in one or other or both that you, you, know, you, you are happy to know about and, and uh, would want to take forward into the workplace. Yeah, um, I think I learned how to adapt because again, these are unusual circumstances and internships I wouldn't have necessarily sought out on my own. So um, I was faced with a lot of tasks that I had basically never had to undertake before. Like again, reaching out to organizations for promotional purposes and um, essentially designing a website almost from scratch <laughs> on a platform that I hadn't used very much before. Um, luckily, I was on a team with people. They were there to support me. So yeah, adaptability, um, teaching myself new skills, not entirely teaching myself, but working with other people to help them um, sorry, to um, help me sort of mentor me and guide me through the process. And yeah, working with people, teamwork, um, collaboration, adaptability, all of that. <laughs> Thank you. That sounds like it was uh, worth the price of admission. <laughs> yeah. Uh, any other questions? Well, you mentioned that you were interested in editing. Um, so, uh, you know, I'll ask my favorite question. How has this impacted on your ideas about your career? Does this reaffirm, did it reaffirm that you, you want to go into editing or did this uh, change things for you a bit? Um, yeah, so I said, I said I was looking into editorial internships and creative things, but honestly, um, as far as my career, it's still very open. I'm interested in too many things. <laughs> so I am glad I got to explore things a bit more through these two internships. Um, I'm majoring in linguistics. I'm interested in research. I, um, I found that through the Western Heads East internship that web design can be really fun, um, which is also useful for a creative person though. Um, if you want to design a website to showcase your work, for example. Um, so I don't know if this has like solidified um, any ideas I have about my future career path. I think if anything, it's opened them up even more, which isn't necessarily a bad thing, um, but it's just given me, I think the skills and the experience I have to explore those um, in a more informed way, if that makes sense. And we'll see where that goes. <laughs> yeah, great, thank you. Uh, our first presenter uh, in this second half is Brittany Forget, and she is going to present on her work with the Timmins Public Library. Oh, thank you. All right, are we all looking at a PowerPoint? Great, so I'll get started. Um, I'm gonna be talking about my internship this past summer at the Timmins Public Library. And it was actually my um, third summer working at the library. I originally started because I just loved visiting the library. So I thought it'd be a nice relaxing summer surrounded by books. But I learned that working at the library is truly so much more than that. And it's providing vital services to the community such as computer access, community resources, and a safe space. I regularly assisted people who were recent immigrants, had just been released from prison, or were experiencing homelessness. It wasn't always the peaceful summer I envisioned, but I got to do so much meaningful work in the community and to develop as a professional and a person. So my SASA internship took place over the past summer in the middle of the pandemic. As I rejoined the library, my coworkers were also just returning to on-site work after spending several weeks at home. But the library was still closed to the public throughout the summer, so that really challenged us to provide our services to the community in new ways. So even though it was my third summer at the library, I knew that um, this one was going to bring new learning opportunities. Specifically, I hoped that by working collaboratively, collaboratively 
with the team to provide resources in new innovative ways and to maintain communications and connection with the public, I'd further the development of the communication, teamwork, problem solving, and time management skills that I'd been gaining throughout my education in SASA. I also wanted to become more engaged in the community and to learn how to keep building those community connections even in these challenging times. I hope that by making this a SASA internship, I'd have the tools to reflect more deeply on the skills I was developing and the kind of meaningful work that I was doing at the library. So my internship supervisor was Erin, who is our assistant library director. So we were in really close contact. She'd support me with any issues I faced, assign me my projects, and provide me with constant feedback on work. But throughout the day, I was mostly in contact with my coworkers, library clerks, reference staff, um, children's program directors, and we all work really closely at the library. There's usually also um, four summer students, but I was the only one this year, so I had a lot more responsibility on my plate. My duties were a little different than summer than usual, so I was assisting patrons now mainly over the phone, answering questions about um, library and city services, walking them through the use of our online resources, which were really popular this summer, um, and taking pick, uh, curbside pickup requests, which I would then fulfill by retrieving the materials, scheduling pickup times, and making um, curbside deliveries. I'd also quarantine the items when they were returned and then reshelve them. There was definitely an adjustment period for me and I think my other coworkers as well, because these were all new procedures that were introduced. So we made some mistakes, but ultimately were able to pull it together really well. And because this was my fourth summer, I had a lot of um, added uh, duties and responsibilities. So for one thing, I did hours of training on serving patrons experiencing homelessness, which was really important to me because the library is a safe space for so many people in our community who are experiencing homelessness. And even though the building itself was closed, lots of our patrons were still in the vicinity. So we were trying to maintain our communications and provide any resources that we could. And those are all skills that I definitely wanna keep with me moving forward personally and professionally. I was also responsible for social media content and organizing a story walk at the library. So I'm gonna focus mm. more on that now. So first of all, we weren't seeing many um, of our children's books being checked out because kids really love to come into the library, touch everything, look at everything before choosing their books. Um, so I made these videos highlighting our new books um, for each age category and edited them all together so that kids could see what our new books were and it really helped increase the checkouts of those materials. And our children's reading club was also seeing a bit of a decline this summer. So I made these videos promoting our grand prizes, which were two kayaks this year. I was given basically complete liberty over the video, so I got to be really creative. And what I ended up doing was some stop motion animations of little stuffed animals that looked like they were paddling through the library. I also scripted and recorded the voiceovers for the videos and edited it all together. So these are stills from the French and English version of the videos because all of our materials have to be bilingual because the community is, um, there's lots of French speakers in our community. Um, and the reading club ended up picking up a lot of steam um, and some lucky members got these kayaks at the end of the summer. My biggest project this summer though was definitely putting together our bilingual story walks because patrons couldn't come into the library this summer. Um, this was our way of going to them and continuing to interact with the community from a safe distance. So for these, we basically set up storyboards around um, prominent paths around town so that people could walk around and read a story as we went. And there were a lot of steps in these um, in order to realize the events and I had responsibility for a lot of them. So first of all, I made this schedule um, to manage me and two children's program coordinators and it included all the deadlines um, and steps that we needed to take to make sure the event was a success. So I was in charge of making sure everything was done on time and managing the team. I was also in charge of making the promotions. So I created um, these posters that were shared on social media and in the Timmins Press to promote our four story walks. And it was my job to create the actual storyboards by basically tearing apart brand new books and <laughs> re plastering them onto the storyboards, um, which I then set up on the day of the event. And I got to be there um, the whole day of the event with a coworker where we set up this booth and got to interact with the community and promote our programs. So we engaged with over 100 people at each of these events and we got great feedback on it. So it was definitely a great addition and really a focal point to our pandemic programming because it was the only time, it was the only time that we really got to um, 
meet in person and create that sort of connection. So through all of this, I really did walk away with the skills that I set out to at the beginning. My communication skills were honed as I walked patrons through our online services over the phone in both English and French. And I worked really closely with the library team, especially when collaborating on projects like the Story Walk. So I gained a lot of teamwork skills. Problem solving skills definitely also came from handling all the mistakes and issues that inevitably came with adapting to our new duties at the library. But we ultimately got great feedback on our services. So that was really great, nice to hear. And my time management skills were also really stretched. Um, I had to balance meeting all of my personal deadlines for projects while also working at the front desk at the same time. Um, and I also, through the summer, gained a lot of useful skills that I wasn't expecting to at the start. So I got marketable experience doing social media promotions when I designed a lot of the promotional content that I've displayed. Um, and I also gained team management and event planning skills by leading the team to realize the story walks. The SASA internship really helped me tease out and reflect on these skills and meaningful experiences that I was gaining. And that in itself is really valuable as I'm now marketing myself and these skills to potential employers. So ultimately this internship was an amazing experience for me and I'm glad I got to share it with you all. So thank you so much for listening. Thank you, Brittany. That was great. And I have to repeat what uh, Madeline Lennon said, what a beautiful library. And that's what I was thinking. It's like, wow, I don't think I'd ever leave if, uh, <laughs> if, I got, if that was my local library. So, uh, so we'll open it up for questions. Patrick? Um, that was a great presentation, Brittany, and I, I love that you started off talking about the, the sort of peaceful bucolic um, experience you were anticipating and then what it turned into. And it strikes me that uh, the library is, a, to generalize, is a much more multifaceted environment today than maybe it was, and it probably always was anyway. So I wonder, based on your experience, uh, so this is quite a specific question about the library, but do, you know, do you think that your experience was particular in being as as complex and and demanding in so many different ways, or do you think that that's the the life of of a lot of people working in libraries to have to be really really sort of diverse practitioners? Yeah, I think it's definitely a pretty universal experience at libraries. Um, I did a lot of trainings that were library specific, talking about lots of the issues that come up across the board. Um, but the Timmins Library, I think is also, um, cause it's in such a like small community um, and it's, it's our only library. So it's really like, um, bring stuff together maybe even more than in other places. And it's really close. Like it shares a building with lots of other services like employment options, um, mental health services. Um, so um, it's a great, like, it's a great space. Um, you know, it provides like a heated space in the winter, a cooled space in the summer. Um, for people, lots of times it's their only um, way to get internet access or computer access. And for lots of people, they just want to come in to get a social interaction. Um, so lots of libraries, I know like um, ours is a little small for this, um, but lots of bigger libraries have like social workers um, on their staff because it really is um, like it's, it's a place where you get such an intersection of people that um, to kind of bring all the services together um, and really reach those people where they are um, really requires a lot of skills that um, so I was able to develop um, some of them, get a little um, taste of a lot of different um, kinds of services and work in the community. Wow. Sounds like a perfect place to mine the skills of a SASA student, if you ask me. <laughs> Thank you. Other questions? Well, I wanted to ask you then, you know, when the, li the library itself was closed and you were talking about how it's actually an important space normally for people um, who are experiencing homelessness. Can you talk a bit more about that and how that kind of played out for you last summer? Yeah, it was obviously really unfortunate. Like that was probably the biggest loss um, was that we weren't able to house a lot of our regular patrons who are experiencing homelessness and who come to the library for just a safe space, like a, an air conditioned space um, and some social interaction throughout the day. Um, lots of our patrons were still, like I said, around the vicinity of the library. We have like benches outside, um, picnic tables outside. Um, so in coming in and out of the library, we would you know, try and interact with them. And we posted 
um, some resources um, in the window, like the hours of the local soup kitchens, because those were always changing over the summer. Um, and I think what, like my CEO, Carol Ann, was a, a super great example of um, really working to continue those relationships. She would spend like her lunch breaks out on the picnic tables and always interacting with people, um, even, you know, during her, her breaks. Um, so it was really great to see that example and to do what we could, but obviously it was like, it was a really unfortunate um, situation and it definitely had like a, a negative impact that really like made me see how important it was um, to have the library be open and the important services that it provides. Yeah, it's so much more than a place where we keep books. So that's, yeah, that's great. Thank you so much, Brittany, that was wonderful. Yeah, I can ask Barb. I think there was one. Question. Oh, is there? A, oh, there is in the Q and A. Thank you. Uh, Madeline Lennon asked, "Did you experience teamwork with the library staff?" Yeah, for sure. And I think it was like my first really work experience where um, I worked with a team so closely. Like everyone at the library is really close in all the different roles, and I work with you know everybody on every day. So that really solidified that that's like something that's so important to me is the the staff and the connections that you make with the staff um, and especially working on the story walk is where I really was my first like management experience um, so that was like a real challenge trying to like manage these co-workers who were really like above me on the uh, scale of the library um, but just um, everyone works so well together and it was like really something that I want to make sure I have going forward in whatever um, careers I pursue next. Yeah, great. That's great. Thank you. Uh, okay, we'll move on. Um, so, Caitlin Lonnie will present next on her internship with the Grand Theatre. Thanks, Barb. Um, so, I will just share my screen. Um, for me, it says it's still loading. Can you, can you guys see it? Oh, there we go. Yeah, it's good. Alrighty, perfect. Um, hello, everyone. So my name is Caitlin, and I'm in my fourth year of an honor specialization in creative writing and English language and literature and a major in SASA. Um, I was born in Vancouver, but my family and I moved here just before my fourth birthday. I'm telling you this to let you know that I am not just a university student passing through this city on my way to bigger and better things. London is my home and I love it for all the things it has to offer. For my SASA internship, I was lucky enough to nab a position at one of London's most prestigious cultural landmarks, one I have visited since I was little, and I'm excited to tell you about my experience today at that place, the Grand Theatre. So my involvement with the Grand was actually in the works as far back as December of 2019, but when COVID hit, the theater industry was devastated and in the scrum of things, uh, the internship was understandably canceled. However, this past summer with the assistance of Dr. Bruce, I reached out to see if there was any way I could still be involved in the project that had originally been proposed as the focus of my internship. And now over half a year later, I'm very pleased to be here to tell you a little about my amazing experience with the Grand as an intern. So just a little background first, if you don't already know, uh, the Grand Theatre is London's central hub for all things live performance, and the theatre is regionally, nationally, and even internationally recognized for its beautiful and professional work. The Grand is also special because of its focus on educational uh, community and youth programming, such as through the High School Project, which is a show uh, where local high school students are mentored and coached in all the different theatre departments, cul culminating in a student production on the main stage, uh, The Spree It. So that's, uh, there's a picture of Les Mis, uh, I believe, in the bottom left corner. Um, they also run the 100 Schools, uh, which, or sorry, they also run 100 Schools, which is a program that involves the Grand touring a professional theater production around to local elementary schools to introduce theater to kids at an early age. So the Grand as we would recognize it today has been operating since 1901. So it's very much a cultural staple of London's art scene. However, since the building is pretty old, that means that a lot of upkeep is necessary. Previously, it had last been renovated in 1978, so over 40 years ago, 
but beginning last spring slash summer, the Grand started to undergo a multi-million dollar renovation and modernization of its spaces once again. So my role as an intern at the Grand was primarily to assist their education coordinator, the lovely Megan O'Hara, in creating a souvenir publication that would document this year's renovation, recap the history, talk to current staff, etc., just to sort of say, this is where the Grand is at this moment in time. A similar souvenir book was created for the 78 renovation, and it was one of the first things I was given to flip through to see what I would be helping out with uh, in my internship. Back in September, Megan and I started to meet on the regular to discuss what specifically I would be doing, and she tasked me with being the primary interviewer of theater staff, board members, and donors on their history and experiences with the Grand, and to get their thoughts and attitudes coming into this significant renovation. So over my time in the internship, I interviewed 18 incredible people. I talked to people on the props, wardrobes, uh, and carpentry departments, artistic administration, the box office, technical directors, and so many more, as well as the two head honchos of the whole operation, executive director Deb Harvey and artistic director Dennis Garnham, who I believe is here today. So thank you very much for being here. Uh, before jumping into the interviewing though, Megan had me brainstorm questions to ask the interviewees, such as, why are you excited about the renovation? What are you looking forward to in a post-COVID theater world? And what have been some of your fondest or proudest memories of your time at the Grand? She then edited and okayed my questions and I was off. So for the interviews themselves, they were mostly conducted over a uh, phone call or Zoom, as you can see by my lovely Zoom collage um, of faces here. But back before winter in the lockdown, I had a few in person as well at the Grand at Victoria Park as pictured to the left uh, or at the Talbot Center downtown, which was really nice to, to get out of the house and not be stuck, stuck on Zoom all the time. I audio recorded the interviews on my laptop using Audacity. And then once I finished, I would set about transcribing the interviews so that Megan could read them and pull quotes from them for the, for the publication. And I usually tried to get the interviews turned back to her within a week, although some interviews definitely took a little longer because they ran longer, sometimes up to about an hour and a half. In terms of deliverables, uh, I just wanted to give you all some stats that I found really interesting. Out of the total 12 interviews that I conducted with 18 interviewees, that amounted to nearly 600 minutes of interview time or almost 10 hours of content. Um, if you're a bit of a geek, that means you could watch the Justice League Snyder Cut twice back to back and just squeeze in the original one as well. Uh, the transcripts themselves amounted to over 80,000 words, which would be the length of about a 300 page book. And all of the recordings and documents took up a folder on my laptop totaling 12.7 gigabytes, which I can tell you my poor laptop was not happy about. In terms of other outcomes from my internship, um, I have to say that my biggest takeaway has definitely been an increased sense of confidence. Though speaking to strangers is always a little awkward, it no longer holds the same dread inducing power over me that it did even a year ago. Awkward encounters are a part of life, as is talking to people you don't know, and though it might seem a little silly, I really have made a lot of progress on this personal obstacle of mine by interviewing strangers for my internship every other week. And I have Megan to thank for her support and encouragement during times I was doubting myself and my abilities. As well as working on my other soft skills that Sasa has been fostering in particular, such as communication, active listening, creative thinking, and interpersonal connectivity, I've also gained a much deeper appreciation and understanding for the theater industry and all the hard work that goes on behind the scenes. I now know that anytime I sit for a show in the Grand or any other theater, I'll be thinking, thanks. <laughs> Um, I'll be thinking about all the incredibly talented people holding the show together off stage as well as on stage. This internship was also valuable to me because I had previously knocked the idea of pursuing a career in journalism off the table due to a bad experience with the journalism class. However, this internship has actually put it back on the table as an option. I really enjoyed speaking with people and listening to their stories, and while I'm certainly no Oprah, I learned that I'm better at thinking on my feet than I thought I was. Finally, this internship was significant for me as a Londoner as well, because I'll be making a little contribution to the Grands and London's history. Like I mentioned, I looked through the 78 renovation souvenir book at the beginning of my internship, and it just blows my mind that at some point in the future, my name will be in a very similar souvenir book that someone perhaps another 40 years down the line might look at during the next renovation. Um, things weren't always smooth sailing though, and I definitely experienced my share of challenges from miscommunication about whether I would be able to conduct interviews at the Grand itself, with the construction going on, to my own nervous disposition about juggling school and the internship, to technological challenges that left my final interview all garbled up and a pain to try to, uh, a pain to, try to transcribe. 
Um, the greatest challenge though was hearing so many stories about the Grand Theatre and not being able to be in the space itself, which is what my internship project was all about. I really wanted to be able to see everything that was going on with the renovation and experience the spaces in person before they were changed forever. And while I was lucky enough that I was given a full building tour last March, I'll always be a little sad that COVID made things so difficult. Nevertheless, I thoroughly enjoyed my time working with the Grand and with my supervisor, Megan, and I know that this experience will continue to have a valuable impact on me moving forward. Um, before I finish up, I just want to plug the Grand Theatre again and say that when it reopens and it's safe to once again gather in large numbers, this is going to be something you're not going to want to miss. The space will be entirely different, renovated and modernized, really open, light and inviting. And with all the wonderful content that the Grand produces, there's always something for everyone. I know I'll be there at the very first show that I can to see what everything looks like and to experience the magic once again. Thank you for listening to my presentation. And if anyone has any questions about my internship experience, I would be happy to answer them. Thank you, Caitlin. That was great. And I just want to make a correction, though. You're not an Oprah yet. <laughs> <laughs> Thank that you. Look, that look Oprah wasn't Oprah when she was your age either. So, uh, okay. Uh, if you would unshare your presentation, uh, and yep. then we'll see if, the, if there are any questions. There we go. Thank you. Patrick? And we'll start with Patrick's question. That was great. Uh, Caitlin, including your slides are beautiful. Um, so uh, this is maybe a slightly trivial question, but I, I hope not. Um, you interviewed a lot of people and they obviously work in different uh, facets of the theater. So in addition to probably talking about the, some of the specifics of their experiences, um, did you notice other kind of patterns of, of interest, we might say, that they had in the theatre? Like, did some seem more interested in the past and others in the future? You know, any surprises in the sort of, I, I guess, some sort of pattern you might have seen in the kinds of things that they like to talk about? Mm -hmm. So one of the questions that I did ask when I was interviewing people um, was whether or not the Grand and its, its, its history and its feeling of history had any impact on the work that the people did today. Um, I got mixed responses. Um, sometimes people were like, yes, it's such a pleasure to work in a, such an old building and I feel the history around me every day and it makes me want to be so much better and to like represent the Grand on that scale. Other people were like, no, actually, I would rather we keep moving forward and like the history is the history, but keep moving into the future. Um, I was very lucky to speak to um, two staff members who were there in the original or in the 78 renovation, which was absolutely incredible. So I got like a full timeline of the grand then up until now. Um, and yeah, just it, it was a differing view on the history. I think it's all valuable, but what you take from that is kind of up to you. Mm, yeah, no, that's really, really interesting. I think there's a question from Dennis there. Mark. There is in the chat. Yeah, he says, I recall the insightful questions in Smart Interview many months ago. When you think about the souvenir book that will eventually come out, how do you hope it represents your experience? Um, I don't I don't know if I'll be able to write anything for the for the souvenir book, but I sincerely hope that Megan might give me the chance to just slip in something to be like I had just an amazing experience getting to know all these people. Um, getting to hear all these secrets about the theater and there's so much that people will never know that I will never know. Um, I heard so many stories, ghost stories even, and that was, that just tickled my fancy. And I just want people to know when they, when they see the souvenir book, um, that even though what's on the page is there, there's so much beyond that. Just like there's so much going on when a show is going on on stage. There's so much behind the scenes that, that you may never see. And just to appreciate all of that. Did you, oh, it's too bad you didn't run into Ambrose Small when you were uh, <laughs> wandering the Grand. Um, I, do, I have a question. Uh, we have a lot of um, students who are attending. Uh, what um, advice do you have to, for them about how to conduct an interview? Oh my goodness, I'm so glad you asked that because I had a little section in my presentation that I cut out because I was going to go for too long. Okay, about this wasn't staged. So. No, no. <laughs> that's great. And stage, that's a good pun. Um, but pretty much um, when I took the, the third year SASA course, I, I was a bit of a nervous wreck when I did interviews. 
um, like my hands would shake, my legs would shake in particular. So like if I was standing up, that was a big problem. Um, I'd speak really fast. I still speak really fast, but taking the, the third year SASA course really taught me to like slow things down and, and just be more confident in what I have. And just to kind of like, I know myself and I know how to represent myself. And that was the best part of the interview, um, was that like, I, I wanted to get across who I was and and that was the most important part and to show my passion because I really did have a lot of passion for the position. Um, and I will say that I remember specifically one of the videos, one of the interview or uh, one of the um, the LinkedIn videos that we watched for the course. Um, I remember thinking about it during my interview and just thinking to myself like, okay, sit up straight, shoulders back, open position, smile, you got this. Like, like you're doing okay and you don't need to worry so much. And uh, even if things don't go like the greatest, if you mess up, if you have a little slip, it's not the end of the world. And that is really something that this internship has has really ingrained in me. That's fantastic. Yeah, interviewing is uh, does not come easily. It's definitely a learned skill. So I, I'm sure you were really good at it too. I mean, to get on the from the get go, but I'm sure by the end too, you'd really develop some impressive skills which will serve you well in journalism. So thank you so much, Caitlin. Okay, we'll move on then. Our seventh presenter today is Jade Rosel. So her, Jade will be presenting on the internship she did with Western International last summer and her ongoing work with Iconoclast. Hello, everyone. Thank you, Bob, for the intro. Just give me a moment to share my screen. Is everyone able to see that okay? Yeah, also just move this guy around. So hello everyone, uh, I'm Jade Rosal and I'm a fourth year student in philosophy and SASA, as well as in the Scholars Elective Program and welcome to my experiential learning final presentation. Uh, for the first part, uh, I'll be talking about my Western Heads East remote internship internship that occurred from July 20th to September 2020, oh, July 2020 to September 2020, sorry about that. Uh, and I hope, just to preface, I'm not too repetitive from my team members, Xiao Xiao and Rebecca. I promise that I'm the last, third and last member of the three woman team from this last summer. So in regard to some of the tasks that we were set out to do and how we did. Uh, the overarching project was to design a website for our community partner, Makone Yetu. And as my team members previously mentioned in their presentations, Makone Yetu is a NGO in Tanzania that operates to kind of promote the economic independence as well as sustainability and empowerment of young women and girls. And for our second project, it was to oversee and make edits to the Western Heads Eats website, which is a collaboration between Western students, staff, uh, and their African partners in order to kind of promote education and sustainability goals. And in terms of how we did for those goals, I think we did pretty well. We were able to create the first live website that Makono Yetu has had in eight years uh, through using the application WordPress. And we also were able to review the current WHE website and comprise numerous suggestions and edits into one comprehensive report that we kind of set off to WHE team to pass on to future interns to come. So for some partnership information, uh, as I mentioned, our main community partner was the Mikoni Yetu team, which consisted of their executive director, Maimuna Kanyamala, and her trusted exec executives. And we maintained this connection through communication via email and WhatsApp to account for the fact that they were, there were different time zones and they'd had different international service providers. And then for our WHE mentors, our team was effectively guided by Stephanie, Bob, and Maria. And this partnership was maintained through weekly meetings and constant communication. And I really enjoyed seeing all the other things that other interns were doing through WHE. And then for project results, I just have a quick little video that just goes through the Mekoniyetu site. So this is just our About Us page where Makoni Yetu just gives little information about everything that they're doing. And then just scanning through some of their programs. One feature about Makoni Yetu is that Maimuna and her team really wanted us not only to present her the Fiti Yogurt program, which is their overarching program, but also all the other great programs that they offer, as well as some videos with 
captions and regarding everything that they've been doing. And a resource library that people can download consisting of information regarding violence and economic empowerment of young women and girls, and then some contact info. So in terms of what my main takeaways from this internship was, uh, one of them and possibly the most important one was learning about the value of having an open mind when embarking on any new experience. This internship started right when the pandemic was kind of just taking off. So it was definitely an internship that my team and I were going into not really knowing what to expect and we were some of the guinea pigs for this first remote internship. But I found that having an open mind to all the experiences to come really helped me with in terms of my adaptability to any challenges that arose. And then secondly, the uniqueness and inherent value of international partnerships is something that I really took away. Uh, I think that as students that attend Western westernized institutions like Western University, we often aren't exposed to the value of international partnerships and everything that we can learn from these organizations. So this internship really gave me a great opportunity to do so. And then lastly, the need to appreciate not only the end goal, but also the process. And once again, with the pandemic, there were various things that, are that came up that uh, caused us to have some technical difficulties and delayed some of our progress. But my team and I was very vigilant at just uh, making sure that we were as optimistic as we could be throughout the way and accomplished uh, what we could and I think that we're really happy with the final products that we were able to do. And then for the second half of the learning presentation, my part two is going to be talking about the Iconoclast Collective Directorship that started in April 2020 and is going on to present day. So for those of you that don't know, I, the Icon Iconoclast is a collective um, under SASA at Western University that publishes two biannu biannual public issues a year regarding all themes related to culture and the arts and all the contributors and the team is made up of Western University students. So my main task as a co-director involved coordinating a team of Western students for the publication of two biannual iconoclast issues. And then I also contributed to the organization and preparation of virtual launch parties that went along with promoting each issue. And then secondary tasks as a co-director included maintaining constant communication with the ICON team and meeting via Zoom when needed, which can be a little bit uh, diff more difficult than you would expect considering all the different teams that we kind of deal with as directors. And then I also had to send emails, review submissions, and recommend edits to our graphics teams. For partners and mentorships, in terms of who Iconoclast works with and who has supervised me along the way, um, the AHSC our team and student council are responsible for the budget reimbursement and faculty wide promo of our issues and we communicate through Facebook Messenger, Zoom and email. And then for my mentor, Patrick, who's here, <laughs> held progress updates throughout Zoom calls and was really awesome at providing really specific suggestions and guidance for all the challenges that I came across. And this is just a quick flip through of last fall's issue unheard. We're currently in the process of publishing and coordinating a virtual launch party for this spring's issue, Stardust. So here we go. And I don't take credit for any of the graphics in this <laughs> copy here. Uh, that's all credit to our graphic design team as well as our artistic contributors. just a little quick flip through. So in terms of what I've learned through this directorship and where have I grown, uh, I definitely had to adapt to new communication skills. The pandemic has forced me along with everyone on our team and along with the rest of the world to function with an improved virtual presence. Whereas previously I really enjoyed more connecting in person, I was forced to kind of uh, transition everything that I knew about interaction and kind of force this onto a virtual platform instead. So that was definitely a challenge, but also a new thing that I dealt with. Uh, I also learned about how the zone of discomfort is the best space for learning. As a individual that has never before worked on a publishing team, let alone been on a director team for a publishing team, uh, it was definitely filled with new experiences that I had never encountered before. But I definitely see so much value specifically in that element of discomfort. 
And then lastly, uh, I love seeing the beauty of a finished collaborative product, especially for something like Icon, where our contributors and team, it's not, a, it's not something that they're doing for a credit. It's something that they're doing as an extracurricular and as a passion uh, to make the best product possible for us and for them. And thank you for listening. Uh, I'll welcome any questions. <laughs> thank you, Jade. We'll just have you unshare your screen. Era, will you start us off for the questions? Okay, um, thanks, Jade. That was lovely. And wow, is that ever a beautiful issue of Iconoclast? Um, I wanted to, I know this is a little bit of a trite question, perhaps, but you know, we're always talking at SASA about how we get students outside of our, um, their comfort zones. And certainly we as instructors get outside of our own comfort zones. And we talk about, you know, that we, we talk about that as if it's a good thing without often saying why. And you just mentioned, you know, that you learned, right, that that zone of discomfort is the place of learning. And I just wondered if you could articulate that a little bit further further and say, you know, maybe even give an example of something that was really uncomfortable for you, if you know, if you would like to, and you know, what you got from that. Yeah, of course. Um, I think that, because I was a SASA transfer, actually, so I transferred into SASA in my second year, um, starting as only a philosophy major. Um, and I think the reason for why I was kind of hesitant on applying to SASA in my first year was the fact that I didn't really have a visual arts specific background like as I I love creative writing poetry and music etc but I'm not really skilled when it comes I mentioned when it comes to graphic design um so that was something that I was definitely uncomfortable with or hesitant about going into Sasa but in my second and third year I we did have opportunities to create artistic pieces as kind of some of our projects for our courses and I found that I really enjoyed the process of creation um not necessarily because I love the final product or thought that it was like, you know, a <laughs> amazingly well, high awarding kind of artistic project, but because I set out to do something and I went through the process and I completed it. And I think as well that Sasa is so great because it like, frequently present students with opportunities to try something, things that they wouldn't necessarily try. Um, and not only throughout their courses, but through internship opportunities like this, which takes you out of the classroom. And yeah, that's the, that's the thing that I uh, definitely love the most about SASA in terms of um, transitioning this zone of discomfort from the classroom to real world opportunities that we wouldn't be able to uh, experience otherwise in a different program. That's wonderful. Thank you so much. Thank you. Patrick? Patrick, you're Patrick, muted. You're muted. <laughs> um, it was great working with you, Jade, so I'll start with that. Um, I, this question is about the arts and goals. Because mm -hmm. uh, sometimes I think that, um, you know, in certain realms, we think you really need a clearly articulated goal. And, and certainly um, that, that can be in the arts as well. But I think about Iconoclast and all the various students that are working with it, it's quite a big group. Mm -hmm. and, I, and I'm wonder, wondering, do you think there is a kind of a shared articulated goal? And if not, is that okay? Is there, is there a, almost like an inferred goal or is there a sense of purpose that maybe couldn't all be put in one line but is really shared among the students? Yeah, so thank you for the question. Um, this year, uh, my director team and I, I think uh, Ronnie's actually here in the participants, so she's on the director team as well. Um, we really wanted to ensure that Iconoclast was going forward with the emphasis on the collective part of the of the of Iconoclast itself and the fact that we wanted to make sure that everyone on the team had a voice. And this is specifically relevant because our first issue, Unheard, dealt with in the light of George Floyd shooting as well as the BLM process protest from last summer. Um, we really wanted to reach out to and make sure that our team was comfortable with everything that we were putting out and every every goal that we had. So I definitely think that when it comes to our theme and it comes to our team overall, there are uh, c collective goals that we that we strive towards but also that there is flexibility and we're we're willing to bend bend anything for the to, to value the fact that everyone has different uh skill sets and suggestions that they, they can put forward which will result in the su success of both issues great thank you 
<clears throat> Thank you, Jade. Uh, so we'll move on then. Uh, Alex Tosik is up next and she'll be presenting on her community engaged work with Western Libraries Read Program and the SWIM organization. Hi guys. Okay, uh, just give me one second to share my screen. I also apologize in advance if I stop to sneeze in the middle of this. Allergies kicked in a couple days ago. Okay. Um, all right, can everybody see? All right, awesome. Okay, so uh, my name's Alex and I am a fourth year SASA student also doing a major in English and a minor in biology. Before getting involved in my community engaged learning placements, I was still trying to figure out what I wanted to do after graduating this year. I had a lot of options and ideas that I was trying to choose between, but the main things I was weighing was whether to go into a career like publishing or to go into teaching. After doing these placements, I can successfully say that I know where my skills and passions lie, and I feel that I can take what I've learned here anywhere I go. So the first placement I did, I did it with Xiao Xiao, was with a local program called Single Women in Motherhood, or SWIM which aims to help provide single mothers with the resources they need to succeed on their own in the world and to provide for their families. When I originally got the description for this placement, I was supposed to be working on the creation of a book project called 20 Stories of Hope, which would showcase empowering stories from single moms. The expectation was to be working off of formerly done research to interview moms and begin writing and putting together the actual book. But as we started on the project, we found that all the former work had been lost, meaning that we basically had to start back at square one. Thus, most of my tasks for the majority of the internship was based in planning and organization and consisted of forming a campaign plan, researching publishing companies and how to create a book, drafting interview questions, and brainstorming and contacting advertising sources while we tried to recover that lost work. So I did struggle a bit in this project. First off, my supervisor, she was a wonderful woman, a very ambitious woman with a lot of ideas, but I got the feeling she had some difficulties in organizing and executing those ideas. And she left a lot of that onto us. And like, as just walking into this project, not knowing what we were doing, that was sort of a major obstacle for me. This, like, lack of guidance, I would like to say, uh, might have been okay under circum certain circumstances if it was more organized, but because I felt like we received very little guidance and whenever I asked her what she wanted us to do or how to do something, the general response we got was just like, you can figure it out on your own, which left me feeling like I was floundering in the project a lot. I wanted to give my supervisor the book she imagined, but I couldn't understand what that was or how to figure out how to do that. And because this project was done virtually outside of weekly office meetings where we gave progress updates, I had very little contact with anybody else in the business outside of like working with Xiao Xiao for getting our part of the book project done. And we, we really relied on one another to get this placement done. I also really wanna give kudos here to Barb who like doing this, I really had issues with like my self-esteem trying to figure out how to speak up and say that this wasn't working. And she really helped as a go-between and gave me a lot of advice on how to get that communication issue sorted out. So thank you very much. <laughs> um, Overall, though, I can still say that I pulled some worth from this project as I got a good opportunity to practice my leadership, self-regulation, and organization skills, while also improving collaboration and teamwork skills in small and large groups. I also feel like I got a good dose of reality. Not every job is going to go the way you want, and you're not always going to have a good working relationship with every coworker. But in the end, you all need to pull together to get the job done, and that's what we did. In the end, when we put together uh, a couple of reports, we did one between Xiao Xiao and I, and I did one myself as well, outlining all my research and all the planning and organizing we had done. 
I felt like we laid a much more efficient and organized foundation for the next person to be able to take over and do what we were actually supposed to do. Um, after months of learning about the whole publishing process though, and what actually goes into creating a physical book, I can safely say that I can't picture myself doing that for the rest of my life. After determining that publishing was not the career for me, I could turn my attention elsewhere. So the second placement I volunteered with was in a program called READ, which works in conjunction with the London Public Library. This program works to build reading, writing, and comprehension skills, and to boost confidence of struggling or reluctant young readers through fun and engaging activities. In this program, I was partnered with a very energetic third grade boy who struggled with focusing and actually taking the time to read the whole word, which paired with a switch from French immersion schooling to fully English schooling caused him to get really frustrated when he tried to read and he gave up really easily. At the beginning of every week in this program, I send my partner a quick little conversational email at an, appro an appropriate reading level to practice with. And you should try to throw a couple more challenging words in there, along with a short reading or writing based activity, such as answering a riddle, following a scavenger hunt list, or doing a word search or a word game. Then during the week, we would have an hour long Zoom session where we would do literacy based activities that didn't make it seem like we were practicing literacy skills, such as playing Mad Libs or Pictionary, putting on short readers theater plays, and making comics. I found out my partner really responded well to doing drawing and arts and crafts activities. So it often start with something that seemed like more of a, a artsy thing that didn't seem like it had reading or writing in it. And then I would sneak those skills into it. This placement was, oh, sorry. This placement was also done entirely online over Zoom. So just like with SWIM, it was kind of difficult to build relationships. However, at the beginning of every Zoom session with my partner, I made sure to start with some conversation, you know, saying, how's school going? Do you have anything new? And we just get to know him. So I feel like that's really helped us to bond, which also in turn helps me to lesson plan because then I can base it on what he, what's going on in his life and what he likes to do. I also have bi-weekly check-in sessions with the program coordinators and other volunteers. In these sessions, not only do the coordinators provide many resources like physical activities, arts and crafts, writing activities, and books for all ages, types of interests, cultures, and in English and French, but they also provide teaching tips and tricks, technical help, and they give individual feedback and answer questions. I found the coordinator's expertise and constructive criticism extremely valuable in as I like to call it, teaching me to teach. And it's very refreshing to have a community of volunteers to ask questions and to hear about how other sessions are going and what's working for them. So we can kind of bounce ideas off each other then. After seven months with the program, my partner is much more enthusiastic and eager to read. And I've seen a drastic improvement in my partner's reading fluency, as well as a major improvement, improvement in my lesson planning and teaching skills as I learned about what works and practiced my communication, flexibility, creativity, and organization skills. It hasn't always been easy. At the beginning, I really had to prod my partner to get him to participate, which was disheartening. And as the weeks went on, I sometimes struggled with coming up with good, creative, enjoyable activities. Overall though, I found this to be a very fun and valuable experience as I got lots of teaching practice for the future, and I felt like I was contributing something to the world by giving this boy important life skills he needs to succeed. Um, and that's it. Is there any questions? Thanks, Alex. I will uh, stop sharing. Okay. Questions? Oh, Patrick? I can't hear you, sorry. I'm getting good at muting myself, but not unmuting. Thank you for your presentation, Alex. Um, I, I wonder if you could say something a little bit more about the, the kind of teaching activity that you were involved in and how you think that might map onto 
you know, I know you're going further into education next year. So what are the kinds of things that you anticipate you would take with you from that experience that you might apply to more of a full classroom setting? So I guess the biggest thing with this program is they don't want to make it seem like you're doing lessons in school or like homework or something like that. So I found that I really had to get creative in trying to find something that just seems like, you know, a game or like we're just laying around, we're just palling about, but then trying to get that practice in at the same time. And I feel like that is what really brings the love of any subject to it. And since I want to teach little kids, little kids are really resistant to any sort of thing that feels like a chore. And so you have to find ways of avoiding that, by, but still getting the practice in. And what this did was it taught me to just kind of think out of the box, to think around the situation instead of just like focusing on this kid needs to practice his phonics or whatever. Instead, it's like, what can we do that integrates the practice of phonics into it? And I think that's going to be really helpful down the line, um, especially now in schools where we focus on not just like driving home those skills, but rather like, how does this child learn? Like, what is there? Are they more tactile or are they more audio or things like that? This way you, you work with the child and what they can do rather than just like saying, here, here's the stuff you've got to learn. Great, thank you. It sounds partly like it's about, such as you're doing here, emphasizing the experiential. Yes, very much so. Thank you. Thank you, yeah. And I also, I just want to say too that um, how you emphasize that it's it's important also to with these experiences to, to kind of find out what you don't like, what you don't want to do as much mm -hmm. as you to find out. Uh, what it is. So thank you for emphasizing that in your um, in your presentation, which was great. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Okay, last but certainly not least, uh, Courtney Wards Batnoff is going to present on her work this year as Western's student writer in residence. Hello, thank you so much. I'm going to pop this up here and move everybody's lovely faces to this side. Okay, everything looking good for the screen share there for everybody? Awesome. So, um, yes, my name is Courtney Wards Beatnoff. Thank you everyone who shared their lovely experiences. I will be presenting my time as Western Student Writer in Residence. So the Student Writer in Residence is a really incredible position that's unique to Western. If you're not familiar with it, it's for um, fourth or fifth year students and you're basically a mentor for student writers at Western. And it's a partnership with the University Students Council and the Department of English and Writing Studies. I'm finishing my fifth year right now and I can definitely say that coming in as a first year, um, all I really knew was that I love to write I was a little book nerd and I was like, this is great. I'm going to get my English degree and um, creative writing. And I had no idea that there would be an opportunity like this, like waiting for me in my last year at university. So it's, it's really incredible. I will be speaking very highly of, it, highly of it throughout this presentation. So I'm going to be talking about some of my favorite events that I hosted, um, opportunities that I had both on and off campus, and just generally how I contributed to the creative community at Western and in London. So these are a few of the bigger events that I hosted. Um, in the top left there, my event, How to Get Published, it was a workshop for students, teaching them how to submit their creative writing to literary magazines and as well as publishing full-length collections. I'd invited a uh, previous student writer and resident, Sydney Bruman, who co-facilitated. Um, they're a wonderful, wonderful writer. And their first collection of short stories is about to be published. So they talked about uh, publishing full-length collections, either novels or short stories. And I talked about publishing in literary magazines. 
And this event was really inspired because I noticed that students are really interested in publishing their work, but they usually don't know what avenues there are, um, or even that as a student, you can publish your writing um, and submit it places and be successful in that. And there's a lot of opportunities on campus alone that students just don't know about. So I wanted to spread awareness about that. Um, the bottom graphic was from my reading with writer in residence Alicia Elliott in November. I had created the event so it would feature student writers and I put out an application for student readers and then I went through them um, and selected which pieces sort of fit within the theme and the time frame and I curated the order. And I opened the event reading from my own um, work, a uh, piece, piece of fiction which I'd never read before, so that was exciting. And Alicia Elliott read from her novel In Progress that she'd never shared before, which was also really exciting and is going to be released sometime in the next year. So we got a sneak peek of her new novel at that event, which was super cool. And the top right graphic was a partnership with Inkwell Workshops, which is a Toronto organization that's um, facilitated and they facilitate workshops for writers and it's also hosted by writers with lived experience of mental illness. And we talked about writing about mental health and practicing self-care when writing. And this was a workshop that was really important to me because I think it's a topic that is really crucial, but it's really overlooked especially in the university setting where it's more about writing assignments and handing them in for a deadline, not really kind of taking care of yourself when writing and um, the complexities of kind of that situation. These are just a few of the opportunities that organizations on campus and in the London community reached out to me as student writer in residence. Back in September, Western News asked me to interview writer in residence Alicia Elliott for a published article, which was the first time I'd ever interviewed anyone. It was um, actually done through email, so it wasn't live. Normally it would be live, unfortunately, but we couldn't be face to face. Um, so it was just um, through email. And it was really exciting to get to talk to one of my favorite authors about her writing. And now that's featured on Western News. So I Google my name and the article comes up and it's, it's pretty exciting. Uh, on the left here, I was featured as the local opener for this Poetry London September reading series. I read three of my poems and this was my first paid reading. And it was a really cool opportunity because I've been attending Poetry London's events since my first year at Western, so for five years, and just as an audience member. And I now had the chance to be a featured reader at one where people were an audience member to listen to me read. So that was really exciting. And on the right side, this is the cover of the 2020 WordsFest zine that I was one of the senior editors of. And this was a great opportunity as well because I was a student editor of the zine in 2016 um, in my first year. And I've had my writing published in the zine for several years of it. And in this opportunity as um, senior editor, I got to read through every submission and prepare them for publication. So I've kind of seen every aspect of this publication as a submitting and as an editor and then a senior editor. And with the bottom graphic here, I was invited to be the judge for the Undergraduate English Society's Poetry Chapel competition. I was responsible for selecting a winning entry and then some runner ups to win um, monetary prizes. And I've also been published in their chapbook in the past and now I had the chance to help curate the publication. So a lot of the opportunities that I had in this position kind of allowed me to re like re experience things I've experienced from a different perspective throughout my last five years as Western at Western rather than being a participant, it's kind of an organizer. And I really got to be, a, thank you. I really got to be a representative of the university so just to share some exciting news, as you can see on the logo on the left hand side of the screen, I've been accepted to my dream program, the Masters in Creative Writing at the University of Victoria. And I thank you for the applause. I, I really think that being student writer in residence um, prepared me for a program like this. The work I was able to do and the connections I made with faculty and students and just the way that my abilities were validated brought me a lot of confidence as a writer. And then the next point down, you can also see, just as exciting, applications for next year's student writer in residence are open. 
And that's the best part about the position in general is that it can be anything you want it to be. When I applied last March, um, like pretty much exactly one year ago, the pandemic was just beginning. And I had, at least in our province, and I had no idea that my final year at Western would be entirely online. And this definitely posed challenges with technology and changing all my events online. But I really, really was able to create a virtual community and make sure that students felt at home at Western. So regardless of next year's school year format, I'd really recommend anyone applying to this. You can always come to my office hours. My uh, email is right there. Reach out 100% recommend. So just as kind of a final reflection on where I've come during my time at Western that has ended in this position of student writer in residence. Um, when I applied to the position, I just had five pieces of writing published, all in local literary magazines. But as of today, I now have 16 publications ranging from Manchester, England to Mumbai, India. Um, I published my first piece of creative nonfiction um, this year and then two more. I received my first paid publication. I was shortlisted in the National Bridge Prize in Fiction and then was finally awarded the Arts and Humanities Student Council Award for my contribution to the arts community, which was really due to my work as student writer in residence. And a lot of these things happened because of the confidence that I gained from this position. And I'm so grateful for the opportunity and will definitely be looking back on this position as the absolute best end to my year at Western. So thank you so much, everybody, for listening. Thank you, Courtney. <clears throat> that was great. Uh, so uh, questions for Courtney. <clears throat> Ask Julia first. I was, I was good. Julia. <laughs> hey, Courtney, first of all, congrats on your acceptance to UVic. I'm sure you'll do fantastic there. Uh, my question for you is, after hearing about all these things you've done, this year, which are super impressive. Uh, what do you see as next for yourself career-wise? Is there anything you're shooting to do? I love that question, thank you. Yeah, I am definitely interested. So for the MFA, I'll be interested in publishing um, like a full-length collection of short stories. After that, um, primarily in creative nonfiction, which I am focusing on at UVic. I am also definitely interested in the publishing industry, um, just with the few opportunities I had as student writer in residence to see sort of the ins and outs. And as just someone who submits my own writing to publications, I'm definitely interested in like a management role as far as career wise and definitely getting connect to connect with authors like as I could through this position. I absolutely love that. And like the writing community has just become such a home for me, like throughout everywhere, every event I've ever been to. Um, so I definitely can see myself going into those two kind of realms. Yeah, thank you. Patrick? Yes, congratulations, Courtney. Great presentation and what a year. Um, I'm, this is about the profession of being a writer or an artist. And I've sometimes encountered students uh, at Western saying, you know, I, I do creative writing, but I don't want to take creative writing because that might sort of basically kind of overshadow my own creativity. And I've heard the same thing in, with students in relation to their visual art. Um, and, and I can understand that. At the same time, it strikes me that you have had the great opportunity to start to understand what the profession of writing um, and being a writer is about. Or, or could be about. And so I wonder if you could talk a little bit about that. I mean, I think you have been talking about that, but you know, did you ever have that fear that, you know, if, if you put a, a, this in a category, it might take away the magic or something like that? Yeah, that's a really good point. And I have definitely heard that as well, um, where sometimes if it's writing or visual arts and you're giving an assignment, it can kind of, people can say that it kind of crushes the creativity. Um, I've never personally experienced that, but I think it's greatly due to kind of always being involved in the writing community and doing it also on my own time. And I think those are chances that I can really kind of direct myself and like find direction and creativity and talk to other authors. Um, but perhaps if a student was in creative writing and just following the prompts um, quite strictly, then perhaps that could come up. Um, but yeah, the best part about like writing as a profession is just getting out into the community and meeting other writers. Like, I don't know, I feel like there's kind of two kinds of writers. This is going to be a tangent. Um, kind of like going into university, I think I was more of a writer where I didn't really like share my stuff because I was quite young. Uh, I'm still quite young, but like younger. 
and it was more like kind of sitting at home um kind of writing writing and not really sharing it but now at this point like like I'd mentioned I've been sending out my work to so many places and it's just such a reciprocal like profession and community that everything you give in you get tenfold back and I really found that through the student writer in residence position too like meeting with oh my gosh meeting with first years in my office hours one girl she already has like a published so many publications and she's incredible she came to a lot of my office hours so I was really inspired by what people would come to me with too so that's the best part of the profession really as a writer thank you that's uh, yeah I really enjoy your answer and yeah I I think it is about community and and support you know I mean you still have to do the work but but having a community is so important yeah. thank you Courtney uh so that brings us to the end of the presentations. Um, and before I hand it over to Era, uh, I just want to say that in your experiences, uh, you've all represented yourselves and Sasa and Western so well. You did so again today with your presentations. Um, I want to thank you. You make my job so easy. So thank you very much. Um, and Era, will you wrap it up for us, please? Yes, I will. And I think I just want to reiterate what Barb just said. What a wonderful set of presentations. You do Sasa proud. You do yourselves proud. And I want to thank you so much for the great feelings that we all have as we leave this meeting today. Um, I, I know that you will want me to thank Barb and I thank her from the bottom of my heart for all the incredible work that she does to make our experiential learning uh, program uh, as successful as it is and uh, she's so great at it <laughs> and uh, it's uh, wonderful to have her support in the program. I also need to thank Jen Tramble and of course Patrick Mann, the director of SASA, uh, for all of their support and thank you so much to our attendees. Not all of you are still here. I know it's been a, a while since we started but thanks so much for being here to support us and to see us and that means so much to us. So I hope you can all go away. I know everyone's really busy, but I hope you can all go away and take at least an hour to just bask in your accomplishments and be proud. Thanks everybody. Thanks Sarah. Thank Bravo. you. Bye. Fantastic.